Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to day two of training, transformation to training, the City Company Symposium on the Suzuki Method of Actor Training. We'd like to welcome you all again and welcome our live streaming audience via HowlRound. Uh, we're going to talk, yesterday we began talking about the past, a brilliant panel, beautifully moderated and wonderful speakers. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the present. We're gonna talk about the training with uh, people who have long and varied experiences about the training. And this afternoon we'll talk about young companies in the future. So to begin, I'm gonna give very short bios because most of you have the bio material in your uh, packets. And also for those of you live streaming, that material is also on the website. But I'm gonna give us a little bit of an introduction to our four panelists to give us a little bit of context. And then I'll begin with the first question. So welcome everybody. How's your legs, those of you in the room? Good, good, good. welcome. City Company member Akiko Aizawa was 16 years old when in 1979 she saw a TV program that introduced Mr. Suzuki and his theater company on NHK, Japanese National Television. Eight years later in 1987, she began working with Scott and in 1998 performed in Trojan Women at the Sydney Opera House. She then performed in eight Scott productions. Akiko joined City in 1997 and per first performed in Culture of Desire among her many other city productions, which include Steel Hammer and A Wright. This December, she'll be in the premiere of City's production of Hanjo, and she is also a member of the City Conservatory faculty. Akiko Azawa. <laughs> Jeffrey Frazé is a veteran theater artist with more than 100 professional credits in the past 25 years as an actor, director, writer, and producer. Jeffrey first encountered the Suzuki training at a summer drama camp while he was in high school. <laughs> Jeffrey's a founding member of the award-winning immersive theater ensemble Connie's Avant-Garde Restaurant, writing and performing in their original shows. Last year, he created and performed in The Life Model, a trilingual multimedia production inspired by the events during the Arab Spring Uprising. He's originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Jeffrey received his MFA from Columbia University. He's a former associate artist with the City Company, having performed in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Culture of Desire, and War of the Worlds, a radio play. Jeffrey's an associate professor of drama at the University of Washington's MFA theater program. Jeffrey. <laughs> Will Bond, Bondo, is a founding member of the City Company. He first encountered the training in 1984 at graduate school from future City Company member Kelly Marr. He later toured in Tadashi Suzuki's Dionysus. Last summer, Bondo returned to Toga to perform in the 40th anniversary Toga International Arts Festival in Tadashi Suzuki's Tale of Lear. What's that? Of the festival, yeah. 50th? Yeah. On the website, it said 40. That's the information I was sent. Thank you for correcting me in public. <laughs> that must have been Ellen. Was that Ellen? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> okay. Bondo has performed internationally in many city productions, including the Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane Dance Company collaboration of a right, and most recently in Chess Match Number no. 5. And of course, Bob. Bondo was awarded the 2013 Impact Dance Movies Commission for a short film, Lost and Found. He recently published in the 2013 Rutledge Companion to Stanislavski, and he's a senior artist in residence here at Skidmore College. Bondo. <laughs> Actor and educator Mark Corkins first encountered the Suzuki training over 30 years ago as a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's professional theater training program. After graduation, Mark was invited to play Cornwall in Mr. Suzuki's Tale of Lear a co-production of the Japanese Performing Arts Center and four American regional theaters. Through his connection to Mr. Suzuki, Mark was introduced to Anne Bogart in the City Company, where he helped create and perform in the first production of The Medium, based on media philosopher Marshall McLuhan. Mr. Corkins has worked with the Utah Shakespeare Festival, Stage West, Berkshire Theater Festival, Madison Rip, Illinois Shakespeare, and many others. Mark has also been a member of several resident acting companies, including the American Players Theater, uh, the Resident Ensemble Players, and the Milwaukee Rep. Mark. Wow, I'm 
press. <laughs> We're going to begin a little bit to give us a little bit of context. We're going to talk a little bit about history. I mentioned briefly uh, when they first encountered the Suzuki training, but I'm beginning with Jeffrey. I'm going to go in order chronologically backward of most recent exposure to the training. And the question is this. Uh, Jeffrey, can you tell us a little bit more about your first exposure to the Suzuki training and what your initial reactions were? Sure. So yes, it was summer drama camp in high school. Um, for those of you who know what this is, actually forensics camp. Ooh, it's just for you. Um, and uh, so I was acting to the best of my ability and an MFA student from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee was one of the teachers there. I think it was Steve Halk. I'm actually messaging with him on Facebook right now mm -hmm. to see if this is true. <laughs> and so amidst this summer workshop with you know high school actors, Steve actually had us doing sitting statues and speaking fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. And um, this was nothing like anything that was happening in any of the other classes in which us teenagers were just trying to emote a lot and feel things. Um, it felt like we were doing something real, and I thought it did some cool stuff to my voice. So um, off I went to college, did theater, never, you know, there was no Suzuki training around there, so backstage I would just do my own frickin' statues and stomp, you know, I had no idea how to stomp, I just heard there was stomping in Suzuki, so I just stomped. <laughs> um, and then after college, I tried to get into a grad program with Suzuki training, so for years I applied to UCSD and UW, got rejected again and again, and then I heard um, that Anne Bogart and Andre Servan were both at this radical new training program at Columbia University, so I got on the phone the next day, figured out how to audition, and um, that's how I re-met the training, because Ellen Lauren was there, and um, then it was real. It got really real. Um, <laughs> and I think we'll go into what that training meant to us um, as we, I'll, I'll let the others do their meeting, and then I think we'll talk more about how it got in, right? Okay, cool. Thank you, Jeffrey. Bondo. Well, as you said, so I was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the time, um, 1984, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I had a, I auditioned for the Three River Shakespeare Festival. And um, I got some little roles that summer. And I'd been working in a bar, pub, breading fish <laughs> at, at, at five o'clock in the morning every morning. And as a result of the festival, the, the graduate school there called me and said, do you want to go to graduate school? I said, yeah, I'll go to graduate school. I don't want to bread fish anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so I went to graduate school. And, um, you know, so it was a, a kind of a, a lucky lark. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a lucky thing, and I just said yes. And, um, and it, it just happens that Kelly Marr arrived at Pittsburgh at the same time, fresh off the plane from Togomora. And I think she'd been there for the last two or three summers. Um, working with uh, Mr. Suzuki and the company, and she uh, and so on day one, we be, she began teaching the Suzuki training, uh, among other things, uh, period movement and uh, I gotta say the the people who come out of that program, uh, the PGDP are really well trained. No mm -hmm. So she had a lot to teach. Uh, among those things was I don't know if you know this in the mid '80s there was a thing called aerobics. <laughs> I, and still, it, I and still it have comes the with an outfit, and, uh, and she uh, so she did that twice a week too. But she was teaching the Suzuki training, and um, at the end of that first year of graduate school, uh, she said very kindly, "You know, you seem to take to this. You should go to Japan." And um, and so she wrote a recommendation for me to Mr. Suzuki and and, and the Japan American Friendship Foundation, which was. Uh, working at that time uh, was very generous and helped people like me go and that was my first nine weeks training with, this, with the Scott company and then Mr. Suzuki invited me back uh, the next summer and then thus began a, a lifelong relationship to the training. So, yeah. Mark. Hey. Hey everybody. Great to be here. Um, my name is Mark. Um, yeah, it's fascinating because as I listen to these stories, I realize how unique they all are and, and how rare it is that you, 
you get to talk about it because yeah. you're just not around people, number one, for whom it's interesting, and <laughs> yeah. let alone th th that they would understand. Um, I, I went to undergrad at uh, Wayne State University, and it was fine, you know. Um, but I knew I was looking for graduate training specifically in, um, in how to talk Shakespeare. And I thought, like a lot of people, the place to go was Yale or Juilliard or what at the time was called one of the League of Resident Training Programs. And um, there was one that kept coming up on my radar um, that was fairly new, and that was the Professional Theater Training Program at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And every little thing I heard about it, I began to be more and more intrigued. And anyway, I ended up um, in August of 1984, starting my first year in Milwaukee. And what, uh, talk about an eye-opening experience just in, in so many ways, but we started the Suzuki training um, from, from right out of the gate, and we did it for that first month, I do believe, at least four hours a day, two sessions. And um, it was, it was really, um, a shock to the system, but also, as I've heard some people say, a little bit like I kind of I recognize this um, as something that that I resonate strongly with, and so um, from from there, I realized that I had a, a real affinity for it. And uh, you know, going back to my earlier training, I realized there was this open or you know conspiracy of silence around the whole issue of how to exist on stage. It was just kind of taken for granted that you knew how to breathe, that you knew how to enter, that you know, knew how to exit, but what, what the Suzuki training did for me is it, it opened that up as, as an area to, to inquire, what is this, as opposed to just kind of skipping over it and, oh, here's your blocking and know your lines better. So uh, that was really the perfect thing for me at the time. Yeah. Great, thank you. I kick us Yes, um, my first recognition of the training came to me 1980 when I was 16 and I happened to uh, watch the TV in Akita Prefecture, rural area in Japan and uh, the youth square or young square, some of you saw the uh, film from the previous day, I think. And black and white TV monitor, and uh, what's going on top of the mountain. And I thought, oh, enthusiast, young artist there. Wow, what's the recognition? And then I thought, oh, I should go to see the uh, Tonga International Theater Festival. Some of you went there, right? And uh, four years later, 1984, I watched the play, and at the end of the uh, last performance, they did the lecture demonstration. So I witnessed the walking and the counting chore. What else? Standing statue and some basics. And I thought, oh, it's weird and strange <laughs> and it hurts me just watching, but, <laughs> but that concentration and, it, you know, I witnessed the play first, and then I saw the training, I got, aha, uh -huh. that's why they're good and attracted and strong and grounded. I decided I should train. So three years later, I got into the company because 90, 87, at that time, the training was not open to the public, so to Japanese. So I sneaked in the company from the office side. <laughs> That's my encounter. It was hard, but I was really happy to be there with my hero training. Thank you, Akiko. Mark, you started us off actually on the next question, so I'm going to come back to you. The question is this, um, Akiko, you have dance training, yeah. uh, the other gentlemen, you've all gone to graduate school. So you've been exposed to a lot of different methodologies and philosophies of theater training. So what was it in lieu of studying Shakespeare and 
forensics and Grotowski and everything else. What was it about the Suzuki uh, training in particular that all of us have gra gravitated to? Um, I, we've heard the name Jewel Walker uh, a couple of times over the past couple of days, and uh, he was my movement teacher and definitely one of my mentors and one of the people that, that really spearheaded having the training be an integral part of, of our uh, program. And one of the things he would say is that maybe perhaps thanks to television and film that we see so much of that uh, actors in America have become talking heads for all intents and purposes. And um, I know that for myself, coming from, as, as Ellen mentioned, an athletic background and a little dabbling in dance and a little in mime and a little in martial arts, I, I had this special affinity right from the get-go with the training and what it allowed me to do was get out of my own head to kind of lose my mind to come to my senses mm -hmm. and that was crucial for me because I tended to as we all do if we get go down the, the rabbit hole of, of the bastardized Stanislavski trying to feel real on stage and fool yourself that you're actually experiencing yeah. the, the, the character um, I realized it, it was such a relief to find a way to, to address embracing being fictional in a theatrical context. And, um, and, and, and that was just a, a tremendous opening for me and very freeing because I realized I was driving, driving myself crazy trying to, to figure out how to fool myself into, I'm not really on stage and you know, yeah. so. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mark. Same thing, Bondo. What? Why the Suzuki training among all the things you studied, including aerobics? Yeah, I... <laughs> <laughs> why aren't you an aerobics instructor? I know. I thought about it. No, you know, I, I, one of the problems with talking in this kind of situation is when I feel, you could feel like a charlatan a little bit. I got so lucky. I just yeah. got lucky. I got invited to go to school. I didn't even know you could even be an actor at that time. I didn't know, you know... Uh, how to do it, and so I got invited, and then thank God I met Kelly for, for many reasons. Um, and and I, I, I guess I will say too, uh, so I can't for the life of me remember what we did in graduate school, <laughs> what we studied, and I think you're expressing it so beautifully, Mark, it, which is the kind of unspoken atmosphere of Americanized Danislavsky or Met, I don't, I don't know what we were doing. And, and I just felt always like I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, apparently I had some kind of ability or something, and, 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 but I, I, I actually, it wasn't so, it was difficult until I encountered the Suzuki training. And, um, and suddenly there was a, a, a palpable uh, 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 way of working. Mm -hmm. You know, working on my breathing, working on being still, working on, on speaking and having a good reason to speak other than some, something that might have happened to me a long time ago. Uh, having a good reason for being on the stage. And so in a, in a dumb way, just technically, it was logical for my brain, you know, to, to, to work with the senses mm -hmm. and work with space and time and have real things to work on. And, and I, just as a creature of needing discipline, uh, it helped me in that sense. And um, so just being, it just was logical for my body. And, and I really, I took to it desperately. I grabbed it so that I had some way of knowing how to do anything. And, and so that's a technical, a, a technical uh, way of answering the question. Um, how to get better. And then I will say, although at 24 and super naive and having no artistic context in which to base any of this, or literary or books or anything, so, um, but the other thing I will say now in hindsight, um, so that the, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Go. Cool. Otherwise, why well, would be up here, I suppose. But um, like it's like the training. So, so there's the, the technical aspect, which I just grokked right away. Oh, this seems to make a lot of sense. 
But the other part of it is personal. And this is, Ellen pointed to this yesterday, even after all these years, it's really hard to talk about why you do it or how to do it even or anything like that. It just hits you, as Sandy said, like a wave that makes a lot of sense to some of us. <laughs> um, and, but the, so that's the public technical side of it. But there is a private side of it, which is, now I would use, I would quote Peter Sellers, and I would say, who says, what gives you the moral authority to stand on a stage? And not moral like well-behaved, <laughs> uh, but moral in a, in a global sense. Um, because, you know, truth be told, I, it'll sound like a joke, but it's not all that fun always to be on stage. I don't always like it, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so what gives me the right to stand there? It, to me, that's personal, that's just me. And uh, like an opera singer he would talk about, or a musician, you know, the 10,000 hour rule or something. Um, and so just the comfort of, and I, I could speak more about the vocabulary as Ellen was doing yesterday, um, but just having the, 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 the foundation of a, a viable and well-practiced and verified training helped me stay there. Uh, and so I, I guess I would say it that way too. That's related for me personally to company also, but we can get into that later. Um, so that's, uh, and, and it was a cellular transformation. I, I, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. You guys are all doing so well. You answered the second question, you started in the third. I started in the third. Je <laughs> Jeffrey, same, same thing. Uh, why, <laughs> all, all the wonderful things you studied at Columbia, why, why the Suzuki training, why still the Suzuki training? Cool, okay, so I'm going to try to be um, focused and maybe a little bit reductive just for the sake of clarity and time, but um, I, I got to Columbia and suddenly the bar for everything was raised. What I had encountered, again, acting-wise in college, some good stuff, but it often seemed um, rather indulgent and it was like, it, it felt like the actor could take all the time in the world. Um, and I got to Columbia and suddenly, um, I had Andres Serban demanding that every second on stage be entertaining. I'm using that word because to him it seemed the worst sin was to be boring. So whatever you do, I keep Andre awake um, in every second on stage. Um, and we met Anne Bogart who seemed to demand that at every second we be aware of as much as possible all the time. And we met Ellen Warren who seemed to demand that the training demanded that at every second we be concentrated, that there be a focus, and we be striving beyond ourselves somehow. I think that might relate to what Tom was saying and um, what Mark was just saying about being fictitious on stage, because we're doing something that's not just us, but we're striving beyond us as well. Um, and then as Bondo just said, it was training, something that I could actually practice and go back to over time, which um, was different from everything else I had met. So I have kept going back to it over time. Great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. When I hear the word training, for, my, uh, for me training is my 16 years uh, dance training mm. and uh, 25 years karate martial arts training and 30 years Suzuki training and the viewpoint training of course with the city company. So I don't have um, so-called theater training but that training is really perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I mean that. Uh, that <laughs> What have we been doing for 20 years? Oh, no. <laughs> University degree or that, that kind of program package or, you know, the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. No, we, we all get it. Thank you. That, that's my sense of humor. <laughs> but the, when I heard training, it's just, it's, for me, it's five of them. But they have the uh, old similarity. It's about your mind and body and the core and the how to deal with the possibility, impossibility, or progress 
training is like my mirror because basic things there so I can see that way I am and also future where I want to go. What I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> so similarity plus it's important to get a good teacher for you. So uh, I got lucky for <laughs> the same, lucky for taught by uh, met Suzuki company or city company. And also important thing happened to me, training uh, because of the city company's mission, there is a teaching is one of the mission. So I was surprised, I didn't like to teach, but during the course with my colleagues' courage, I uh, began to teach. That was the training too. Because, you know, even yesterday, today, only a uh, limited amount of the time, when I train or I teach in charge of the class, it was the training. And then uh, Suzuki training is my core because it fit me. I cannot explain, but that training talked to me and I can respond. But not it's only Suzuki training, it's mingled uh, the, all of my life something. Did I answer you? Yes, you did. Okay. Thank you, Akiko. Um, so Bondo, you, you, you talked about... I just got lucky. I just... <laughs> <laughs> well, it, isn't that, isn't that, that's true for all of us in the room. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. there, lucky to be here. It's the same thing as the, getting the job. You know, mm -hmm. There's so many people that are talented that, that, that aren't working. When you get a job, a lot of us luck that we're in this room together. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ellen and, and Mr. Suzuki, but it's also partly luck. Um, but going back to the next question. So you talked about the ability to exist on stage, Mark. It's beautiful. You talked about the moral authority. So, and then you also talked about this on, the cha the cell on the cellular level. So how has all, all this training, all, all this existing in the Suzuki method, has it changed you in some way, both as an artist and also perhaps as a human being? And I'm not trying to get too ooey gooey, but seriously, yeah. has it, has it, how has it changed you, if it has? Well, um, I mean, if you go deeply into it, like anything, I suppose, anything, any rigorous training, whether it's Suzuki or anything else, it, 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 it my, in my experience, although my encounter was so rapid, and then going to Japan so rapid, that it hit really hard, really fast, but in my, my experience, spending a lot of time with it, of course it transforms you. Uh, especially if you start really young and have no world view and no, <laughs> you know, system of belief or anything, uh, it does become a kind of world view. A, there's theater happening out in the world that is not anything like what we have here. And most of the theater isn't. And then so, so suddenly just, you know, as a global citizen, you begin to be more, live more inclusively or, or be more accepting of, of other things, um, which I think art is supposed to do. Say yes, come in. Um, so, so there's that, so, so then, it, and then it gets political, and it gets political in the sense that I realized very quickly after I, I won't, well, I could describe it, but after I went to Japan and realized, oh, there's a company of people doing this, Suddenly, I realized, you know, maybe stuff that was intuitive already, I wanted to be in a company. I knew that very quickly. Um, and that's part of a way of living. That's part of a way of making work, A, but also you know, driving to get there and eating meals together and sharing holidays together and, and having, you know, building a, an ecosystem, I guess, of, of a life. So, so that was a change, that was a revelation and, and that's the way I realized I wanted to live my life. So, uh, so you know, it, does it change you or do you just sort of go, oh, right, that's, that's who I am. <laughs> anyway, you know, so um, I will say, am I addressing the question? Yes, you are. I don't want to get, yeah, right, it gets wide pretty fast, doesn't it? Um, and, and also, back to the moral authority, part, part of it is the training, but it's also 
because of you, you know? And, 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 the, and the company that says, okay, go, you can. You have permission to go do it. You could be terrible, that's okay, it doesn't even matter, you know? Um, but here we are, agreeing to do something together. And that's a very lucky way to be, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, same thing. Has it changed you, and if so, how? Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> um, and it, it's probably difficult to accurately characterize from, from in here. There, there was a time, late 80s, early 90s, uh, when I was involved uh, very heavily with, with Suzuki in the rehearsal hall, uh, mm -hmm. performing, like, I don't know what it would be like to do Trojan Women eight times a week. But we did we did the tale of Lear eight times a week in in uh, you know regional theaters and whoa oh, baby um, <laughs> so that was an interesting collision so anyway coming off of that I realized that because my other colleagues not in that world knew of my connection to Suzuki they would sometimes ask when I was doing so so is that is that the Suzuki stuff and I just. Yeah, you know, you just cringe because you, uh, ultimately, as I think we've tried to articulate, it becomes part of your marrow and DNA, as opposed to I've got a technique that I'm going to apply here. Um, but it does become internalized to the point where, not unlike Tom Hewitt, um, I've tended to specialize in psychopaths, <laughs> dead people. No. Um, <laughs> I've played a lot of ghosts, and I, I don't know if that's, if, if that's something that was there originally, and the Suzuki training kind of gave me a container to, to put that energy into, or if the Suzuki training really allowed that realm to open up as something, you know, just by default, okay, he's better at it than anyone else, so get, get Mark to play the, the ghost of Hamlet's father. Um, but just technically, uh, the, the kind of energy needed, both in terms of, of, of intensity and control to create the illusion of something that's otherworldly is directly related for me back to what I experience in training. And so, yeah. Has it changed you? Yes. <laughs> and I, I'll start kind of, I guess I'll start with the personal and maybe a little superficial and hopefully that'll grow into something artistic and a little bigger. Um, but I couldn't get anywhere on time for the first 27 years of my life. Um, and yeah, at, at some point, hopefully we all learn that one should show up on time. But for some reason, um, with these teachers and this, this company, um, it, went, it went deep inside. And so there was a question, there was responsibility, frankly, um, that I learned for both time and for space. And now is the part where I don't know if I'm talking about what I've learned from Suzuki training or the viewpoints or simply from uh, being with City Company. Um, I learned so much uh, from this company this, the, the, that are with us here um, in the room. I had never encountered such rigor and in, and self-responsibility in the rehearsal hall. So the, the bar for what how, how I was supposed to be in rehearsal went way up from the first day of rehearsal with these guys. And um, I feel like that is the training in them, in their bodies, and they transmitted that to me as much as I received lessons from Ellen and other company members in the classroom. Um, it, it was part of being among these artists and, and, and working with them. So I just work harder now, and that's more natural, and more of what I demand of myself, and now also of my students and actors who work with me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my mind, or how to approach the production or rehearsal room uh, changed, it's more, stable, grounded, and uh, yeah, taking responsibility. Body is up and down. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes I cannot stump aging, maybe, <laughs> knee back. But, but 
but mm -hmm. I got, even if I can't stamp or proper, I, I couldn't do the proper form, my, what? <coughs> yeah, it's getting stronger. And there's some success and some failure up and down, but getting better. That's my change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Again, we're, the questions are leading to the next questions. Um, one of the wonderful things about this week in the scene, the spectrum of backgrounds, the spectrum of ages, which I find very moving to see the, the, the levels on so many ways of the people that are here. And it's that, Akiko, the next question is that, you know, age. So all of us here in this room and on this panel, we all have a long history with the training what is what has changed, if anything, mm -hmm. with the circumstances, which include, of course, aging and loss of flexibility? How, how do we, how do you deal with those changes, and yet trying to commit to that sense of rigor and discipline, which is such a part of the training? Jeffrey, I'll start with you since you're the youngest. <laughs> sure. Well, yes. When I got back into the training in grad school with Ellen and other company members, I. Um, yeah, I was very strong, um, so I, I took to it. Um, I dug uh, the rigor and the temperature and everything, and it yeah. felt like, great, I'm, a, I'm an athlete, and I'm meeting something athletic, and let's go. And now, uh, roughly 20 years later, I, um, because of my various other athletic interests, I don't have much cartilage left in my right knee, and yeah, things hurt, and I'm just not as fast. Um, and so it's come to mean something else. I've had to get smarter about the training, not just thinking about it, uh, not just stronger, but smarter. And I think the thing I mentioned earlier about how concentrated, how focused I am in every moment actually means a lot more now because I can't get away with the shit I used to get away with on stage, just powering through. Um, it's So the training is now going I think more up here or here in the sense of the, the, the in the sense of my mind, if one thinks in I guess yogic terms of mind being your whole being, um, your your consciousness. So it's so I'm pointing at this, but I know it's here. I'm pointing at this. Um, but yeah, Suzuki training has gone more fully in my consciousness, if you will. Wando, what, yeah. what do we have to do differently now? Do we? You and me? <laughs> no, yeah. Us. Well, uh, is that the same question? Yeah. Well, oh, well okay. how, what, 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 well, yeah, how so is the circumstances changed? Thinking, Do we need to change? Yeah, I was thinking as Jeffrey, you know, in a way it's like a, like a great painting or something, you know, the train, you know, you, you, as you get older you don't make the painting look older, <laughs> you know, you have to make wrinkles on the Mona Lisa or something. You know, there you are, again, in front of it, you know. And, and it, te it tells you something about where all of your whole history, you know? And um, so, and, and, and for, I think if we're being honest, some of us, you know, yes, when you're young and you're fast, mm -hmm. you know, you, suddenly it's, it's a training that supports who you think you are. Um, yeah. And then, and also on the other level, there's that kind of, uh, that hit, you know, that you get from it, you know, or any, anything that really inspires you and you, you sweat and you, you feel like you did something for an hour and a half or four hours or whatever it is. But then at a certain point, I love, I love what you said earlier about um, entering and exiting. Like just how do I get on stage and how do I get off? Basic, basic stuff. And then you realize once the speed falls away or the interest in a cool shape falls away, You can enter, like when you go up and do statues, you're practicing entering, in a way, and then expressing something if you have something, you know, if it happens. But, so just back to basics again. I'm just learning how to enjoy entering and exiting. <laughs> do you, you follow that? So, uh, so, so, so it doesn't have to be so shiny and flashy. When you watch those people last night, the Scott Company, right? Just glow. Be really still and enter. <laughs> I mean, it's transformative, isn't it? It's not, it's not a normal human 
way of being. And, and that's what I like too, in terms of Tom's book about this, about the, the fictional self. It's not asked of us very often, even in theater. And that you, if you want to play on that level and not be a normal human being or a ghost, Everybody's a ghost, as Suzuki said in his documentary. You know. We're all insane, <laughs> and uh, and 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 you get to do it sometimes in this training. It seems very clear. Touch your insane self, but in a very controlled environment. <laughs> I'm, now I'm just rambling. Sorry. <laughs> Mark, how has how has it changed? If uh, it has. If it has, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the surface level for me is that as, as I've gotten older and I'm, I'm not with a, a group like City Company where the structure is already in place, the infrastructure to yeah. support ongoing training. So my encounters with it, there, there tend to be gaps and there's always, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to tell myself there's a way to prepare, but there's really not. So it, it's always a kind of a shock to the system to, to start to jump right in, but because I've made the trip before, it's not like on this path I'm getting whapped by branches and I can't. I, I kind of know the path back and it, it, it somehow is more streamlined. I remember, um, and this is just jumping back to a personal experience I had, because the very first year that I trained, I was lucky enough to, thank goodness, uh, see a production of Trojan Women Sandy got our whole class down to Chicago uh, to see uh, Shiorishi in, in the lead role in, in uh, Suzuki's company. And we had already been training for a while, so we had the training first and then saw it. And then we had the great honor of having Suzuki and Shiorishi and a man named Kenji Suzuki uh, come in and kind of give us another shot in the, in the arm about training. Um, and it's fascinating because, uh, I don't know if Leon's in the room, Leon was a sea change for me several years later because we finally had someone who had the depth of knowledge of the Japanese language to actually translate what was being said, whereas any question that was addressed, um, we, we just didn't have good translators. So you always come back with, uh, Kenji would be, um, mm, yes, uh, so, uh, mm, maybe to, um, Mm, Suzuki san say uh, <laughs> stomp harder. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, you know. And, <clears throat> so, <laughs> so, so the benefit of training with Shiorishi and, and working with her, we had a, 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 a scene, um, uh, uh, Oh Splendor, I don't know how many of you know that line, Oh Splendor of Sunders, Menelaus. We actually did uh, encounters with Shiorishi as Hecuba, you know, and, and that experience that Tom d uh, described of being literally blown off the stage um, was, was exhilarating. But also to watch her train, and I don't know how old she was at the time, but I could see she wasn't, her, her answer to the training was not just stomp harder. She had internalized this inner sensibility and just throwing a lot of energy and a lot of speed and a lot of <clears throat> at it was not for her what was required. And uh, that was great for me to see as someone in his mid-twenties. And now, you know, however many decades later, I go, ah, I, I can still train, but I don't do it with the same degree of, I don't know, uh, violence, per se. But the, I hope that the, the, the inner thing is, is still ignited. And a lot of the training came out of her body, which yeah. is the source of a lot. And you could see that last night watching the, the performance. Akiko, how, how, what, what changes, if any, have you had to make, as you said earlier, not being able to stomp that day or your body changing or? Yeah, j just, uh, you know, for example, basic number one is here, it, it's there. And then I will switch the focus, what I'm working on. Sometimes image, sometimes stump harder, sometimes consistent, or sometimes attacking, really attacking, and uh, the 
feel miserable. Let feel let me let me allow to feel, be feeling miserable to decay my energy. So, or sometimes I made the acceleration strategy. Mm -hmm. So there is a tons of, of course, breath. Breath is now most important thing for me uh, when I do basic number one. It's challenging, especially shakati part, new school. Yeah, training is not changing, I said. I was wrong. Ch training itself is changing too. So I, I catch up. It's just not getting easier anyway. So, and I accept that fact. I won't panic. <laughs> <laughs> just go, going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's good for all of us to remember the room. It doesn't, you know, even though, even though we get stronger at, at a, until a certain point, yeah. it doesn't get easier. You know, the more we know about it, the more it enables us to continue to, to raise the level and the bar. So again, you guys are doing great about pushing. Go, go, please do. I, I want to jump in there because it's something that you're really important that you're speaking to, and and um, I, I made a joke about it yesterday in training a little bit about feeling sad. You know, there's the there's the as Ellen beautifully said, there's the goal, right, and then there's you, and how you close that gap. You spend your whole life closing that gap, hopefully, but that that's. But I feel sad if I don't get my needles together or whatever. And you were saying, you know, something similar just yeah. now. But what it it sounds like a joke, but what it points to is that if you're actually encountering the container, that it holds an emotional life, which is the really the only thing that matters, you know, in, in a sense. And and being able to express it accurately, of course, for the stage. But that but but the and as you get older maybe it, it becomes more apparent because the problems become more acute or interesting maybe even um, but that but that suddenly you encounter this very palpable thing and then you don't judge being sad or mm. or excited or something it's just oh emotion great here we are you know what I mean and I and, and we, we, we don't often talk about it in training certainly you know we don't talk about the inner life so much not, not often or I don't but it is pointing to that, no? I just wanted to accent that somehow because it's important. So we talked a little bit about how, how, how do we change because the circumstances, age, whatever, flexibility it, well, over the over thing of training. Injury. And, yeah. Or injury. Yeah. And, and so the next question, which is related, uh, and maybe, maybe I, this might be after the panel talks where I might go out to the audience a little bit as well, but um, so it changes because of the circumstances of age, but also a lot of people here are connected to companies, but a lot of us aren't. And a lot of us work outside, not in companies, or we're in companies and we still work outside. You're going to work in the right time. You, you work with Connie. You work more with uh, other companies. Uh, so what is it like then? What, what, what changes or do you have to change? Uh, when you're trying to access the training, if you do, when you're not working with a group of artists who have that same sense of rigor or vocabulary, even if, whether they have the rigor or not, that sense of vocabulary. When you work, um, maybe some people in colonies do have training, but if, when you work with people who don't have, what do you do? You do you change how you prepare yourself? Does that question make sense? Yes, I'm thinking in context of Con Connie's is aesthetically so different from City Company mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or Suzuki Company. Um, I'm not. I'm trying to figure out if I can efficiently make a good example of that. I'm not sure I can. That's like a. It's it's rigorous in its way, but it's completely chaotic. So I'm gonna. Can I take the question as a freelance? Of actor course, sure. And the sort yeah. of meeting professional. That's actually narrative? more where I'm going. Yes. Yeah. Um. I. I'm going to have to admit that after working with City Company, I'm a little spoiled, mm -hmm. and I can be quietly a little bit judgy um, in the room sometimes when I don't think other actors are bringing what I want them to bring. And uh, I try to keep that quiet and just do my work. And here's something, God, I hope this, I, it, with all humility as part of the exercises that we do on stage, like when we're doing basic number one, um, there is, you're taking care of your own stuff up there and trying to support and you know, 
bring it to the room yourself, but there's also a sense in which you're taking care of your ensemble. Mm -hmm. like, um, like, I think I'm hearing the rhythm maybe a little better than somebody else, so I'm gonna help translate while I stomp, I'm bringing somebody with me, bringing the rhythm to somebody. Um, that's like on the rare occasion that I am hearing something better than somebody. But, um, and I'm also listening to other people, so I think there's also a way in rehearsal energetically to try to bring people to you and to try to translate energy from the material to them and listen to them and hear them back uh, be a kind of a conduit. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm trying, I think I'm better, but I, it does mean that I'm in my way trying to push a little bit things along in the rehearsal process. And that is something that I credit how City Company raised the bar for me, so I'm trying to do my part where I can out in the world. That's yeah. great, thank you. Exactly. Mark, does that question make sense? No. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it may be slightly tangential and, and I don't, um, I don't want to get too judgy either, but uh, oh, way back in the early 90s, uh, a lot of us were, were part of, uh, in Toga, a master class for teachers and the better part of a month mm -hmm. and we pop up, you know basically got the the basics you know spelled out for us and um this this is what you you are sanctioned to go out and and teach and then skip ahead whatever 20 years and i'm encountering now uh where i am in milwaukee students of a uh, couple folks uh, steve pearson and robin hunt who teach they taught at UCSD, they taught at the University of Washington, Seattle, and now they're at the University of South Carolina. And I'm encountering these students who um, graduated as directors or actors, and they, they sought me out and said, let's, you know, let's do some regular training. And it's interesting to encounter them, me realizing now I'm old school, and them expressing, oh, Oh, we we don't do stomping and shakuhachi. They they discovered that the, the the shape in which students come to them these days, they're afraid of people having heart attacks. And I I remember I, I remember expressing this to to Ellen and you know at a distance in, in cyberspace, us just kind of shaking our heads. Um, so it that's an interesting. Mm -hmm. you, that, that things have evolved on different, you know, different paths, and then we can't come together uh, 20 years later, and I go, that's not something I recognize, you know, and, and trying to negotiate. Can we do stomping at least occasionally, you know? <laughs> Which is, the, yeah. then compare that to doing, you know, it a couple times in a row, our first day here. So, so that's an interesting, which is great about coming together again and kind of reorienting. Um, finding uh, that that compass point is, is really useful for me. Just being reminded. So, uh, Mark, can I just follow up a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, because I, that's great, thank you, and that is true. But also, w w what do you do when it's not about a training, but when you're when you're working with people, just professionally, who don't have the training, aren't, aren't interested in the training, how, how do you, I don't want to say keep up your chops, what do, you, what do you do so that you still feel, yes, I'm doing the work I need to do, uh, whether it's accessing the training or something else, but does that make sense? Mm. I guess it does, and, and I, 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 for, for me, it doesn't. It's not showing up as as an issue in, in terms of. Mm -hmm. I think in in my younger days, I, I used to definitely have a. There's a standard, people, and um, <laughs> I must admit, I I've softened over the years. I I I, I think um, I, I, I've stopped trying to uh, think that I can control other people. You know, and um, <laughs> what a revelation! <laughs> um, 
so, so yeah, at best, I would say, uh, uh, <laughs> even though it, do, it does sound not, not terribly humble, but, but say, simply saying, I'm gonna, you know, if I lead it all in, in certain situations, it's gonna be purely by example, and, um, and not necessarily, I'm gonna give you, mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you a little hot tip here, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Kiko, you, when you work with Ragtime or, or other groups outside of city, uh, similar question, what do, what do you do so that it doesn't, you don't come across as, I, I think I know more or you're doing it wrong, but what, what do you do for yourself to continue to work at the level that you think you need to work on without uh, it distancing you from the people who are at that moment part of your company? Yes. Um I think I want to answer that question from a different angle. When I was in Suzuki company, um, training is eco rehearsal. And then the training is, it, during the training, Mr. Suzuki is there if the audition kind of dead or alive. Really, really, it's not the cl classroom live or die situation, it's really high tension. Because production itself and the training menu, physical score, it's really connected with the training, really not connected. Or sometimes, you know, uh, the production's choreography, not choreography, uh, not blocking, production, part of the production, it's getting into the, most of the time, other training material. And this city company, it's the different angle when I joined the city company. So I'm not driving for the, I, so situation was different, training attitude. And how to say it, but, I realized Suzuki training is any, if you go on the stage, very practical and useful. That's what I learned. And then when I'm going outside of the city company or Suzuki company or whatever, not sharing the viewpoints or Suzuki tra training vocabulary, vocabulary I have, I just try to be, uh, serve the production, so I'm not thinking I am from the Suzuki training, viewpoint training, dance training, karate training. That's my attitude, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Bando, would you like to add one thing? To of course you can, and then I'll ask Bando. Sorry, Bando. No, no, please go. <laughs> um, uh, so it doesn't always seem as though I'm um, going like try judging. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because sometimes I encounter, um, frankly, like brilliance in other actors who don't share my training. Mm -hmm. And I think an another thing that th this training has offered me is a way to respond to that intelligently as opposed to just being blown away by somebody else's brilliance. Mm -hmm. I actually have a technique to draw on whereby I can respond better to whatever I'm getting. Yeah. So thanks for that too. Yeah. Thank training. you. That's yeah. a good point. Bondo. Yeah, it's true, Jeffrey. Acting is acting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, from whatever tradition you come from, and so, uh, uh, and uh, and then on another level, you know, doing this training and working with the Scott Company, as Tom said yesterday, I think it was um, you spent a lot of time by yourself, yeah. self training, self rehearsing. You know, you 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 have to show up in a room. And you're released to have a meal sometimes, <laughs> and you and you train, and then you go over your choreography, and you and you're, it's a, a all day affair, and then suddenly there's a convening in costume, and Mr. Yeah. Suzuki watches what you did, and uh, and so and to prepare for that too, you're even before that experience, training alone is just part of the part of the game, whatever your training is. I'm thinking of right. I'm thinking of Roberta Carrera from the. Barbara Company, Gino Barbara, and who had, you know, they had to make up their own training, they, and they, they teach that to people. So self-training is is a big part of it. Um, and and when there was no translation in the early days, and you just tried to do it like Kenji, you know, uh, that's how you taught yourself. So so self-training is a big part of 
that process with the Scott Company. So it's natural. And then just kind of on a, on a stupid level, when I work, work in a regional situation, I really try not to let anyone ever know about Suzuki training or viewpoints or anything. You know, truth be told, it, get, it can get a little culty, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of judging, I think we'll probably judge the lot as a city company. You know what I mean? Yeah. So one wants to be careful about that. I don't want to take the conversation in that direction. But um, so one's personal way of maintaining one's artwork is one's personal thing. Yeah. I'm going to take this out to the audience and then after that, uh, talking if anybody, if anybody would like to address that a little bit in terms of, this, I think the way you put it, great, uh, self-training or what do you do with your working with someone, with a group of people who've never had any training or have no interest in training. Uh, and then after that, I'll open it up in general to see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, so, uh, yes. Can you can speak up just a bit, please. That's a great question, but first I want to go back and if anybody would like to d address what it's like for self-training to work oh, on your own. No, that's all right. That's a good question. That's a good question. I want to come back to it. But is there anybody who would like to address what it's like to try to do your work when you're working with people who have no, no interest or knowledge of the training? No. Everybody here working? Yes. Uh, Jesse. Yes. Anybody else? Oh, uh, Ben. You know, on one, oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> on one level, the, it's, it's a little bit like, I mean, when we go to work in an opera or something, uh, you know, and we'll run a viewpoints day or two and, and uh, ever, just get everybody on the same page. So it is possible with, a, with the right spirit to pull that off. 
Um, and, and we invite people to work in the company frequently, and they train with us, you know? And sometimes we help them, and sometimes we don't. We just say, get in line, you know? And, and uh, that unspoken training starts to happen. So it's, it's certainly possible to do um, without being uh, you know, too aggressive about it. But there is a language, we, and it makes me think of what, what Jesse was just saying, you know, the fact that you have to, you know, in our culture, we're, actors are taught never to talk to each other about their, how to do their work. You have to tell the stage manager that he's standing in my place, why, you know, or, or he stole my joke. You know, is that true though? And, and so somehow the, the talking about what we're actually doing is, has to be done secretly, if, if allowed. And I've certainly been told, you know, don't talk to me about what you're, what you're doing. Or, you know, um, I'm not gonna, you know, have you ever had that experience in a, in a regional situation, mm -hmm. for example? The fact that one has to feel like they have to go underground, I don't know who decided that. Well, if you go to underground, underground more of like the source. I know, of right? <laughs> but like to go yeah, to, I'm sorry, I'm hogging the conversation, but then that's related to Philippa's question, which is that, um, the thing that's most important to me in terms of your question, if I understand it, is it's a very old artisan way of working, which is body to body, you know, like a blacksmith or something. You, not graduate school necessarily, although I went to graduate school, but, but, but that art is transferred energetically body to body, like Kenji teaching without having a, a language, you know, you just do it. And, uh, and that also allows for evolution, it's necessary. So you can make a better hammer or whatever. Uh, so that to me is partially what we're doing here, is just physically body to body. Uh, it's an old school way of learning, isn't it? More human maybe in, in that sense. So anybody else want to talk about that? What is it like, again, if I uh, can articulate the question or understand it for myself, what, what is it like to deal with the lenses that change when you study with someone and then you study with someone who studied with someone and studied with someone who studied with someone. How, how we're, we're, we're lucky again, and luck has come up so much, that we, we're, we, we've had this opportunity again to see not only uh, to get together and train at different levels, but to see where the training can lead and seeing Mr. Suzuki's work. But well, what is it like to, to train with someone who trained with someone who trained with someone? Just, uh um, it's just one of the answer, mm -hmm. one of the answers. Uh, City Company collaborated with Martha Graham Dance Company uh, in American Document, and Bill D. Jones, Annie Zane Dance Company, as a uh, right. We simply exchanged the training. The mm -hmm. dancers learned the Suzuki training and the viewpoints, and we learned how to dance as we Introduction <laughs> or whatever. So it's open-minded, and then so sometimes you know, company versus company. Let's share. That's the one of the way to go, I think. Does anybody else have any uh, a question? That yes, sir. Yeah, I. Zayami, who created the No Theater, wrote all these essays that are very cryptic. If anybody's tried to read them, yeah. uh, he'll say, be elegant, but there's not one word in there about how to be elegant. Yeah. And that's the gap that you mentioned, Mark, and he yeah. talked about how to be on stage. Yeah. And so what they did in those days, you didn't work in another company, you worked in that company only. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it was passed down from master to disciple and, and on and on and on and on. The difference with Suzuki-san is that he's made it public. And I was thinking about what popped into my mind when I heard you use the word gap several times, Mark, and I appreciate that a lot. This is the how-to part as opposed to the what. Mm -hmm. What to do, you may know, but how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And what popped into my mind are these lines, I think many of you will know these lines, uh, four brief lines from a song. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect gift. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light is. Did that. Leonard, Leonard, Leonard Cohen. <laughs> yes. But then, for me, that's the how to part, and it's cultural. Suzuki-san has created a public culture 
that is being pervasive but not yet universal yeah. around the world. And it enables, that's what, so how do you be on stage? Why are you on stage? How do you enter? How do you exit? How do you be silent and still be active? Yeah. So these are neat tricks. <laughs> thank you very much for this discussion. Oh, I thank you, Joe. Jesse has a question, but I'm going to see. Does anybody else have anything they'd like that? Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh yeah. So I just want to share a query that um, some of us I know are thinking about. We had a, a really interesting conversation over breakfast about some of us who are trying to bring the work to middle and high school students, hmm. attempting to. And uh, just I, I don't have an answer. We we were kind of brainstorming about it and hope to continue the conversation. But how do you approach the material so that often that age range needs all the answers before they're able to jump in. And how do you approach it that way? Um, I, I really appreciated, I'm sorry. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey. Jeff, yeah. yes, uh, what you said about um, your forensic summer school and how <laughs> your teacher just said, we're doing these statues so you could speak, right? And to me, that was like, oh, tool, okay. That, you know, so how do we, those are the questions I think we have and I don't know there's going to be an answer, but um, bringing this to a younger crowd to get them inspired in the way that we're all inspired by it. I know a lot of grad students who like to know everything before they try it. <laughs> 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 and then the second year they think they know it. And they, yeah, I know. I'm working on that with my grad students, just getting them to go, do it, and then think about it. Yeah. But, I, I, but I've taught high school students too from time to time and I've loved it. I've found them really game and um, I think maybe that's a key word. It's like, it, it, it's like a game to see whether you can do this. Like, let's see whether you can shift your weight. <laughs> you know, how fast, get underneath your center. Um, and they seem to really respond to the, 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 the gaming, the, the athletic aspect of it um, and they respond to the fun of it, whereas a lot of the grad students seem to come in with like, oh, this is work, I'm a very serious actor, and now I'm going to do very serious training work. Um, which, I mean, there's something to that gravitas, too, that's appreciated, that, that I appreciate, but I, I, sometimes I want my grad students to have a bit more of the spark of life and of the fun, and of just like the, the little twinkle in the eye and the sort of, here we go, um, that, the, that I found in, in the younger students. So I don't know if that's, I, I don't know if I have advice for teaching high school students as, except to say that in my experience, they dig it, just go for it, I love it. It's a challenge in itself. And we are, we're starting a support group for those right to teach, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested. You know, talking about, about the difference between game, a game and, and, and play is that game is play, but with rules. And, it, and it's the rules and that idea of the how to is, you know, is kind of really crucial. But there is that sense, there has to be a reason for them to want to do whatever it is that they do. At a certain level for us, it, we look at the artistry and we go, we want to do that because we want to be, we do this because we want to be able to do that. So maybe it's a way of finding out what is it that you can engage them in so that then you can challenge them to do something that'll help them get to that level. I'm not supposed to talk, I'm just a, <laughs> Lee, did you have something you wanted to say? Well, it seems less pertinent. I, I don't know. I think there's a question or a thought that I have um, as about sharing the training mm -hmm. and a responsibility question. Uh -huh. um, in terms of, you know, I've been, I, I've, I guess, first exposed to, to, to the training at like 20, but have been really seriously trained. Um, conservatory and I have a lot of things, right? And I, but, but, I don't know, I don't know. And it's been nice, it's been exciting listening to all of the things mm -hmm. here and, 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 and talking to so many folks who share the training or, or seek ways to share it, which is something that I mostly do in the ways you're talking about, by showing, in, in, in a room, showing up, doing my work. You know, talking about it when it's appropriate. You know, what, what have you done? How did you get here? What does that mean to you? But but to just but to walk into a room and be like, hi, I'm Lee Hendricks. I've been doing this for a hundred
five minutes. Um, it's <laughs> been happening for a real long time. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's like that, that I'm up. You know, and I think that's a question a lot of stuff is, to, is, 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 is what, what the thought is. And I don't know. But asking yourself can be part of it. I think, I think that's a great point, just a place to start the next conversation. We have about 10 minutes left. We won't finish it here, but I think that's where I'd like, no, no, this is where I'd like to start the conversation that will continue at breakfast or at lunch or in the evening, but which is that? Well, what is a, what is a responsibility? What do, what do we have as artists to ourselves, but particularly here at the symposium? What is it? Do we have a responsibility to, and particularly because this is the Suzuki symposium, do we have a responsibility to the Suzuki training? Would anybody like to comment on that? Uh, yes. I would. Maria. Maria. So this has been a question that's plagued me for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for me, the important thing was establishing the what for. Mm -hmm. Because when I left Koga in 91, I didn't have a group. Um, and I was going back to the commercial career. And uh, as a, a dear uh, mentor of mine, Christina Castrillo, of the Astro Della Radici said, why are we doing all these gymnastics when what is required of us as commercial actors? Mm -hmm. And so the what for became really pertinent. And so when I began to thanks to my experience working with Anne and seeing through the American theater what was demanded, what could be demanded of me, mm -hmm. um, I had to create my own what for. Mm -hmm. And when I had to create my own what for, I had to re-examine the training and repurpose it and say, ah, well, it's important that I swim because I need this amount of energy to do this. It's important that I do a waltz because I need to understand the specific physical relationships. So can I unpack this, the how and the, and the why, that enabled me to enter a room with a teacher, and I had no teacher, but when I entered the set, that enabled me to re-enter the room with a tempo and say, oh, I know what it's for because I had to do this very practice. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, that's very, it was very important to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm really super grateful yeah. that we're all together. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, uh, you know, there, there, it's also true that, um, I don't know if you agree with this, you guys, but it's, it's certainly true in the viewpoints training, you know. Uh, I don't, we don't ever think about the training when we're rehearsing. <laughs> you know, we, we, we have a sort of feeling about being still or space or something, but you know, it, once, once you've trained, it, you, it's, you've trained, you know? And so it's not so literally a part of the, you, I, you know what I mean? Like you don't think about your process necessarily. Um, so in that sense, I, I, I don't have a problem with it, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and I also want to say that however, and with the what for, I think that's so beautifully put. Mr. Suzuki often talks about, you know, um, how, you, how you do the training, or so let's say you're getting up in Shakuhachi, tells me everything about what you think the theater is and what it could be. What for? Why are you getting up? If I read it right, you have a dream of a theater that looks like that. You know what I mean? And it becomes very practical, suddenly, what your belief system is. And that's a kind of a big leap there. But, um, so the what for is built into that. And if you don't know when you're 24 or whatever, and you just do it, suddenly there's a what for might arrive, <laughs> you know, arise or something. That's what happened to me, actually, I think. Yeah. Luciana, you wanted to say something? Yeah, it's about uh, when you share uh, with someone that couldn't be here for any reason. Uh, I think the most challenging thing to do is the ethic aspect of the, the ethic? Yes. Because just what you said, like the ray you erase from Chakuhachi says the kind of theater that you believe. Yeah. So build this environment, global environment, like here, uh, of this, what kind of ethic 
uh, do you feel as an actor? And if you go to a young, really, really, really high school younger actor or different company members that don't share this kind of training, it's not really about how your body deals with, because even with this training or another training, it's really particular, right? Mm -hmm. How your center of gravity deals, your breath, la la la. But the most challenging thing is how you can work with different people with or without the training in this ethic aspect. Because otherwise, it, it will be really hard to build art if we share like totally different deals on art itself. Make sense? I'm sorry. No, it's this is going to be really. I'm talking about. Like, yeah, I, it's, it's, yes. it's a word that I think it's, it matters, it has this weight, you know. It's a political choice being here and training and sharing and with all the responsibility that it has itself. This is going to be really interesting because Legacy is next and there are companies right. here mm -hmm. who have trained with us and other people. Probably that's the big question yeah. for the next compo symposium. symposium. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, so uh, the idea of politics and the fact that you bring that up, I think is relevant to what you're saying as going out and telling your, your acting partner, like, oh, by the way, like this is the, there is a political act there that is something that we, that, that is helped in the culture of training together and being an ensemble together and something about ego, the word ego is still coming up for me and our relationship to it and and the, the what I say is that you've got to be your ego at the door. Like there is a way that we come to the work where what we're making is more important than ourselves and that that conversation that I'm having with you is instrumental to that. Um, so I think there is a political, there is, in my view of how I make work as, as an ensemble member, this is a political act that I take very seriously. Respect. And I respect that. I respect when I go into other people's ways that it's not going to be that way, but I've actually started to eliminate the choices I make around the art and the people that I want to be working with, and maybe that's just my judged way of getting getting what I want in the world. The you know, like making the art that I want to make in the way I want to make it. But um, I think that, that politics is, is an important thing to bring up in this forum, because we as artists, and especially as we continue with legacy and training, these are choices we are making. And so that consciousness of those choices has an effect on the American view. So I can't put it any less than that. That is what well, we're doing. Well said. I think we'll take one last question or comment. Yes. Um, for me, this, I mean, we're all here. We're all coming together. Um, the company, we're an ensemble. And it's about being together. It's about having another person, being in a relationship. Um, and so maybe this is advanced and practical, but to do that self-training that you were talking about, Will, um, specific to Suzuki. Mm -hmm. I know you can bring principles of Suzuki and other, other training, but mm -hmm. is there, are there risks and are there tools, tricks, whatever around that? on the forums yourself? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, what do you guys want to say about that? I, just on a superficial level, you know, go into the gym. I go, I go into the gym and I put my socks on and I, sometimes I play Arcade Fire and sometimes I play the stomping music <laughs> and I just do it. And uh, I suppose that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't mean, am I answering your question? Like, it's, it can be as dumb as that, or swing a stick and then try to talk. I mean, it's, it's I, I, I think that's how I'm hearing your question, so I don't mean to... It seems more syncretic in that regard, uh -huh. as opposed to as opposed trying to, to do the basics one through six by yourself. So yeah. The, there are some basics that can be achieved by yourself, able to be practiced, as opposed to 
needing that extra nearby reform or somebody who's giving you to you? I think it's really important to, to have a set of eyes on you. Yeah. That's, that's Anne's job. You know, uh, I, Anne is here from Halloran. I keep saying Anne like you're not here, I'm sorry. Uh, um, when, Anne, when Anne brings her attention to a rehearsal, that's, that makes something happen, the heat and the, and the heat. And I was saying, we were say, talking, I, I, I want Suzuki-san to be sitting in that chair for you to train in front of because, as he would say, you have to get past me first, you know? And it's not easy. And it changes you. It, it's a physical, chemical change that you go through. So yes, I would say if you have somebody of respect, put them in front of you, and it's embarrassing. But, uh, but I think it's really important to have eyes, definitely, on you. I have a proposition that I think might tie what you're talking about very practically to what Deborah is talking about politically. Um, there's a lot of answers to what is technique. I'm going to offer a very simple one. It is the ability to be seen and heard. That's superficial. That's also psychological. People need to be seen and heard. It's also political. Mm -hmm. People need to be seen and heard. There are people who need to be seen and heard in our culture. The more you can practice being seen and heard, the more you have a voice, mm -hmm. I think. And you can help other people be seen and heard. Absolutely. And, and I, I'm going to say one short thing, because we're out of time, which is this. I, I, I'll say it a yes and. I think there's also the practicality. You, we have, in terms of what he gave us, the how-to, which is brilliant. And it's game and rules. However, there are those times when you don't have a good floor, so you can't stop. Mm -hmm. Or there, or you only have 15 minutes, because that's how much time you have before you have to start. So there are, there are always circumstances, age, you know, space, the people you're with. There's circumstances, but we have a structure that we can judge ourselves against. And when we're, when we're able, when we have like-minded artists and a good space, then we can, we can try to adhere to that structure. But I, I don't think Mr. Suzuki would say, you know, if you can't do all these six, you know, in the perfect space with great people, you can't do it. I, I, it's what do you need to do to be able to do your work at the level that's of a high quality? And to be able to do that at certain times with that, it's great. And then other times, we're all going to have to make uh, circumstances dictate what we're able to do. On that note, I'd really like to thank Mark, Bongo, Jeffrey, Akiko. We'd like to thank, like to thank the uh, audience, if there's one at HowlRound, and all of you. Uh, we're going to take a coffee break, and then we're going to go to our next terrific panel. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, guys.